J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello. I'm, I'm J.T. Crowley, and joining me today is Claire Goff to talk about her debut novel, Truth Be Told. You should never judge a book by its cover, for sometimes the outcasting doesn't necessarily reflect on what lies between the pages, and this book certainly fits in that category. A bit like life, I suppose what you see is not necessarily what you always get in life, what you follow up, what you actually see. And as I said, this book is very much like that. So the blue rose, that's a very soft image. But what you're going to see in the book, everybody, just wait and see. Um, Claire is from Kent, and that's in the United Kingdom. And having had several conversations with her over the past few weeks, she's opened up to reveal that her personal life hasn't always gone according to plan. So without further ado, let's ask Claire to come on the show and see what she's got to say about her debut book. Claire, would you like to come and talk to us? What can I say? What can you <laughs> say? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. Um, oh, there's so many reasons behind my writing the book. So many. All right, let's get to that in a minute. Claire, um, I think it'd be fair to say that you've led an interesting life. Um, a colourful life and some of the paths that you've uh, gone down, went down, weren't exactly magical. Is this book uh, you telling readers what some people face, experience in life? Yes, definitely. Do you want to expand on that? Well, I think for myself, um, the struggles of being a single parent has been tough. The stigma, the discrimination, the hardship, the loneliness. Yeah, I needed to express that. And I think not just for other people, for myself. It's, you know, it was a healer writing. Mm. And yeah, for me, it was to get a true representation of the lower social working classes of our time. As I've discussed before with you, John, um, the CEO, oh, yeah. <laughs> he shouts out very, very loudly about the fact that, you know, traditional publishers do not take on lower social working class writers. Um, however, he's still got his door shut. So as much as he's shouting about it, he's not opening the doors. And that was one of my biggest, biggest burners, shall we say, to get to get my story out there, to get our story out there, the lower social working classes, certainly from a single mum's point of view. And hopefully, you know, one day uh, that my novel will be studied to understand the social lower social working classes and the times and the obstacles that we were up against for the future, not just for today. For today, it's more of a crime, romance, exciting, naughty novel. But I also... Certainly say, naughty in part. <laughs> It is naughty. I was actually, um, yeah, I, I didn't actually have sex for two years when I wrote this novel, as you probably can tell, John, as it's saturated in sex and the lack of, or, you know, the hopes and desires of that love that we all crave, you know, the silly little princesses around the world. I think we all crave the same fundamental prince coming along, you know, looking after us, having wonderful children, and growing a beautiful family. But it doesn't always work like that, does it? It doesn't always work like that, no. Uh, and I think your book certainly reflects that. Mm. Um, there's a rawness to your book. Was that intentional? Yes, it was intentional, definitely. Definitely, 100%. Um, my childhood, I, uh, my mum, uh, her partner was very abusive and at the time, I don't really think it affected myself or my brothers or my sister. But being a 40-year-old woman, nearly, I know 100% that drama, that carnage, definitely had an impact on our lives. So did that um, 
Or is that more of a reason for you to write this book? It was one of the reasons. I wanted, you know, I wanted to portray what really goes on in the world, whether, it, you know, and my own father, you know, I didn't suffer any violence from him, but my mum did when we were younger. So again, you know, I love my father. I'm not, I don't judge him because of that, but I try to understand the reasons behind that. Mm. And in the novel, I talk about the, the, the unskilled workers, shall we say, who can't actually get a decent job to pay for their family, to pay for the roof over the head, to pay for Christmas, to pay for a holiday, to pay for a weekend in a caravan. They can't mm. do it. So they're turning to other areas to make their money. And that's not just that either. Can you imagine how, uh, you know, the impact that must have on a person that they can't provide for their, their family? that you know, their self-worth has got to be on the floor. So they're either going to turn to alcohol and drugs to escape from that, which I'm seeing where I live, or they're going to join the drug dealers so they can actually give their children a half-decent existence. Because I know, John, being a single mum, my wages, I earn apparently good wages in the world. No, I don't. Me and my children struggle completely. And working in recruitment in, a, in an environment that is exploiting, you know, it, the consultants so I'm happy to be in the office at 7 30 in the morning and I, I've, got, I've got to leave at six o'clock that's fine but when I've got two children sitting at home waiting for mummy to come home and cook dinner and I'm sitting on in the traffic for a whole hour it, it's just unreasonable the stress that comes to that you know the the fact that my children are being left in a vulnerable situation uh, from three o'clock in the afternoon there was one occasion my son was riding home from primary school mum I've fallen off my bike I'm in a completely different town. I can't even get to my baby boy who's fallen off his bike. I've had to call a friend, a friend's then gone and picked him up. What sort of mother does that make me? You know, it, I, it didn't bow well with me. I wasn't being the parent that I should have been. And I also couldn't be the consultant that my boss wanted me to be because I had this big, you know, I was torn. You know, who's more important? The money to put the roof over the head and to feed us or, you know, to care for my child. It was tough so tough and that was another thing i wanted to get out there I, I appreciate the government i appreciate that they help us but they don't give me my husband's wages they just about cover my wages so you can only imagine the poverty that we're constantly stuck in and it, it's not been nice it's been devastating just that lack of money every day that lack of funds every day and i noticed that i did put a little i don't even, I only put snippets in the book there was one comment i put in the book where kate's children child Sadie and her granddaughter was staying with her mother and that weekend she was so thankful because she didn't have enough money to feed the children that weekend and me uh, my two children's fathers have never given a poop <laughs> literally they do not get involved they've never given bean so for me I needed to express that because I've I found it so difficult you know the thought of my child going away for the weekend okay. yeah. I've not got to feed him all weekend you know, the pressure straight away is off. But I've never, I never had that. Never had that in 17 years. Because that years. comes across in some of your characters. Um, yeah. How, how long did it take you to um, write this book, you know, um, I started, create these characters? Okay. I started it the month I left university in 2014. And because I was so scared of being unemployed, I went straight back into recruitment. My where well, I literally started off in recruitment on a YTS scheme, uh, £50 a week when I was 16. So to go to uni, to go to college and then come back to that role, it, it just, it, it, it doesn't make sense, does it? It's not what society says that's mm. going to happen. Society says, you go get yourself educated. You will have enough money to basically live. I still didn't. I was still struggling in the world of recruitment, not being able to leave the office till six o'clock. I was fine. I'm all right at home, peeling the veg on the phone to clients every night. My bosses didn't mind that, but they wasn't flexible enough to let me leave at four o'clock in the afternoon and work at home. It was a very controlled environment. Um, I, I, the thought of ever, ever having to go back into recruitment scares the life out of me, John. It really does. They don't appreciate you. They pay absolutely diabolical wages. And coming from a single mum, I needed more. And there was the last year I worked in recruitment, I made my company a £137,000 profit. I walked away with £27,000. It doesn't buy well with me. That's capitalism at its best, and I can't stand it. I believe in capitalism. I believe in growth. But I don't believe in greedy capitalism. And because of my single parent status, I felt that they exploited me on that. It was, I was the desperate job seeker, and they knew it. And 
Oh, uh, yeah, it's made me angry. Because some <laughs> of this part of your life is coming through in the book, isn't it? I mean, yes, you, definitely. I mean, your pains, my anger, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely I mean, in the book, Kate is the main protagonist, uh, yes. but you've also got some other strong characters, and they are strong characters, you know, uh, Sadie, your daughter. Amongst John. Yeah. You should see some of the characters that I've surrounded by daily. It's quite. Some people say they can't resonate with this because they're so far away from our world. But then you've got a lot of people that do resonate with this. Yeah, and you know, you've got Frankie and William and Aunt Lane. These are all strong characters. Um, and I said, you know, listeners, this is a book that you may, you may not like it. Uh, it's got a rawness to it. It's coming from a very different angle. And you just might see that, you know, different people from different parts of their society lead different lives. And I think this book is uh, one of those books that's going to perhaps open your eyes. Um, so, but I'm fascinated. Yes, you talk about uh, 2014 when you started to write the book. Oh, but I stopped. Uh, that was my point. Sorry, I go off, don't I? No, I stopped because of work. Work's so demanding. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly... Ah. So I didn't pick it up again until 2018. 2018, when my, ah. When my baby girl was bouncing away in her bouncer along the lounge. That's when I finished it. And I finished that, it in 2018. It literally took me about four months to complete the actual novel. So you actually, you've said to me in various conversations, you can read a book in a day, can't you? Oh, yeah. When I was at uni, I had to read two novels a week and two plays a week. So it was very intense. Mm. So, yeah, oh, don't get me wrong. My housework's neglected in that day, John. <laughs> and it's a bit much a pasta for dinner tonight, kids. But, yeah, yeah. come into that. Yeah, I do. Um, love so, obviously, the book is a little bit around the concept of your own life. That's how it came about, wasn't it? 100%. Yeah, my experience of being a single mum, the stigma, the discrimination was definitely a big motivator for me to write it. And also, <laughs> there's so many, so many secret little dates and things in there. There's a big, big dig at my son's father. Big, huge. And I noticed picks, that because yeah. in the book, there are 42 chapters. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, you know, there's many twists, there's many turns, there's many uh, storylines, multi-layering going on here in this book. Um, but I want to, um, as I said to you in the past, I think your life has been very much a snakes and ladders life. And I think going to university for you was one of the ladders because you went to the University of Kent, which is down uh, in Canterbury. Um, you, you read drama, um, English and American literature. I certainly did. So was this a turning point in your life and... I think this was, this to me comes across, this is, you know, you're the phoenix, um, you know, rising from the ashes. I've written yeah. poetry about this. <laughs> I really have. Did you enjoy um, life at university? It what did you tough. learn from there? I learned, again, the English literature department don't like my kind. <laughs> um, the discrimination from the English literature department was, it made me sad daily. My drama department begged me to leave English literature because they were just, they were rotten to me. They didn't like me. As soon as I opened my mouth, apparently, they, they knew that I was from, you know, the lower social working classes and I didn't fit their mould as such. And me being a mature student, I, I was tending to constantly raise my hand in class, John. And again, the English literature men, lecturers, should we say, did not like that. The foreign teachers in English literature, may I add, were beautiful. They were amazing. But I look back now and I think that is purely because they probably had a very similar existence to myself, being a woman, certainly of a foreign um, nature, that I feel that, yeah, they would have experienced some sort of discrimination throughout their lives. Hence, they had a different approach with myself. And I certainly got better grades in those particular module modules so it really did if you look at my grades in the, some of my drama I got a first in my playwriting I, in one of my um, English literature my Shakespeare I failed and me and my uh, English lecturer we, he didn't like me <laughs> and I think it, it really did show in my learning and my my obviously my um, essays etc 
That's what I said. There's a rawness to your writing. Yeah. And I've picked that up, you know, in the contents of the, um, the novel. Um, do you intend to develop this debut book into a series or is this just a one off? I know I'm starting the sequel now. It is a continuation. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in and out, dipping in and out of the sequel for some months, but again, work and trying to find another form of income so we can survive um, is really overriding that at the moment. So until I can kind of switch off to the financial pressures, then I will get straight back into it. My, you know, my biggest ambition in the next 10 years, I want 10 years worth of books on the shelf, which to me is 10 books you know, release a book every year. And I want to kind of release it on the same date because it's a personal date to myself. A very good friend of mine died um, and that's her anniversary, so yeah. Would you um, consider looking at other genres, writing about other Oh, definitely, yeah. I've, me and my daughter, she's four and she's obsessed with unicorns. And literally last night we're discussing characters and my daughter's Lydia Rose. My nephew is Poison Ivy. <laughs> right. Got nothing, yeah. And we're literally having a little, little play around now. I do want to write a children's unicorn book because my daughter's so obsessed and there's not enough unicorn books out there, John. So definitely, I'm, I'm open to writing from all angles. I love writing, whether it be songs. I've wrote so many songs. I've wrote so much poetry. Not, I'm not the best at poetry. I'm happy to hold my hand up at that. Um, but I do, yeah, I love writing. I, it's a healer for me as well, a major healer. Certainly um, poetry and songs, I find it very, very cathartic. So would you recommend to uh, people, you know, to write, if, you know, from, particularly people who have come from your background, to explore and get their stories out? Oh, uh, gosh, yeah, more? would I? Yeah, it's a big recommendation. I've, a lot of my kind, I say my kind, yeah, but where I'm from, it's about survival. It's about going out to work, hence, you know, my cleaning days. It's about earning the money to put the food on the table there and then. You don't have very much of a long-term outlook coming from the council estate world. You, don't, you can't, you can't afford to. It's a... You know, I'd say even the last 17 years has been a major hickledy pickledy run for me. Whether I've been employed, whether I've been unemployed, whether I've been both and survived on the government, it's just been a matter of survival. And you literally chase your towel just to get that bill paid or get that bit of shopping done and get the car on the road. Like when I went to college, when my first, uh, they, the government stopped all my money. They said because I wasn't um, available for full time work and I was doing a full time job they stopped my money I literally had 50 pounds a week to live on for me and my son I lost my car I lost everything but it was all in the hope of things would get better this will be this will change my life my son's life it will give us a completely different being I hoped I hoped <laughs> and I was walking to college and I'm talking six miles a day I was walking to and fro now I look back and I think oh, I feel like the little lost girl you know <laughs> All alone, trying so to better. Why, so that's why, Claire, you know, I picked up, you know, in your bio and the chit chats we've had before this podcast interview, um, you know, your life is very much the snakes and ladders. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, right. a lot of snakes and some few uh, ladders. And, you know, when the ladders do come along, I think that you Don't take them. them. <laughs> and I think the university and perhaps this book is, is a ladder. So no, who, who do you see as your market for this book? Oh, definitely women. Definitely women. I'd say women from the age of 16 plus because of the sex and the, the, the darkness of the rapes in the, in the towel. Definitely it's got to be 16 plus. But I do feel that, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt a 13 year old to read it, especially from where I'm from, because they might actually see where life could go and where life shouldn't be going. Um, and definitely, I, the, um, I've got a lot of fans. <laughs> I love it when I say that because it sounds so cliched. But um, a majority of my readers, I'd say are men as well. I get some amazing, amazing reviews from men. And every day on LinkedIn, my lovely, wonderful platform that is my only selling platform, may I add, um, it is men that probably compliment me on my writing and my book. So I, I would say, you know, it's, it's targeted for both men and women. So where can people get your book from, Claire? 
it's available on Amazon, it's available on Apple, it's available on Barnes and Noble, and it's available on Kobo. Not that I really know Kobo. <laughs> so when, when's the sequel coming out? I aim to get it out the 24th of June to 2022. That would be a year to the date that I released Truth Be Told 1. But why the 24th? I like I say, it was my very good friend. It's actually her birthday on the 24th of June and she died the year before. And it's just a bit of a, a bit of a, you know, a, a memory for her. Oh, well. Guess when my birthday is. Is it the 24th of June, John? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to guess this. When's your birthday? 26th, actually. It's the 26th. Oh, lovely. Do you want me to release it on the 26th, John? <laughs> no, you can put that on the 24th. That's fine. <laughs> oh, bless but you. It's going to be in the same sort of style, the same sort of genre. Yes, the same yes, sort of... totally. It's totally. It is going to fast forward a few years to the pandemic. And oh, we're yeah. going to see a lot of hardship. A lot, a lot of hardship. So... It's like in the introduction, you know, I, a lot of your characters, I've said, are um, down-to-earth, hard-bitten, uh, no-nonsense characters. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be in a similar sort of vein. 100%. 100%. Wow. Um, I think that's going to be interesting. Uh, because, you see, but I think, you know, your book here is, it's certainly not for the faint-hearted, is it? It certainly isn't. Um, it's certainly um, a book not for those who've got a very judgmental mindset. 100%. 100%. I don't think my um, academics at University of, University of Kent, the whole English literature department, will enjoy it anyway. I'm sure they'll pull it apart, John. But big, big middle finger up to them, John. <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go there. <laughs> so, Claire, it's been, you know... Fascinating just to get a, an insight into a little bit about your life, um, why you've written the book, your thinking, and also to introduce people to your book, you know, Truth Be Told. It, as I said, it's certainly, it's not a book for the faint-hearted. It's not a book for those who've got a judgmental mindset. Um, if you, but if you like a book that's punchy, pithy, down to earth with lots of twists and turns that dips into the criminal underworld, the skullduggery that goes on here. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, indeed. Um, and the shadiness of, um, of life. Ooh. Then maybe this is a book for you. Or, you know, so all I say is simply go and have a look, go and have a read. Um, but it's certainly it's a raw it's a book with a raw edge so have a read and see what you think so for me I, it was an interesting book um and it certainly opened my eyes to a different world and i appreciate that well that's uh, oh, <laughs> yes um so as i said go and have a look go and have a read you'll either like it or well, you it. it's, it's a marmite book. It's a marmite book. I love a bit of marmite. <laughs> How do I? It's a marmite book. And I was a marmite character when I was at work. The other I'm night. a marmite yeah. girl and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Claire, Claire Goff, thank you very much for coming on to the show today and to talk about thank yourself you. and your book. And it leaves me, as I normally say at the end of the show every time, is I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe.